Well, hello and welcome back to Box Office Chat, where we discuss and break down the top 10 films within the United Kingdom's Box Office. Stephen, this is for the weekend. I don't know what you're going to tell me in a minute. Yeah, January 11th to 13th. Thank you, you bailed yeah. me out there, Stephen. Uh, what have we got at number one this week, Stephen? Number one Great this start. week, John, <laughs> is Stan and Ollie in its first week, as uh, we just said, 2.6 million over the weekend, grossing obviously 2.6 million overall, yeah, surprisingly. It's, it's opening weekend, yeah. yeah. Uh, this film, John, um, Desperate to see this. Um, um, I'm a bit tied up last week, or mm -hmm. I would have. I think it came out on the 11th, 11th, yeah, it, the 11th yeah? of January. Uh, yeah. So it's um, it's a film I want to see. We talked about this on mm -hmm. our um, audio podcast, I think it was. We've been speaking our audio show. Um, months, though, yeah. uh, when the first trailer dropped, um, looks like it's going to be very drama based from yeah. what we see. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's um, quite emotionally. Uh, driven as well, so it's going to be interesting to see um, the other side of the camera to these legendary mm -hmm. actors. Yeah. Um, you know, the two different people um, oh, yeah. share different views in their personal lives. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see the performances of Steve Coogan and John C. Reilly in the uh, lead roles as well, as mm -hmm. well as the supporting cast as well. It's a uh, it's quite a good supporting cast as well in there. Um, it's a film that I desperately want to see, John. Um, mm -hmm. Big fan of Lauren Hardy, but. I don't really know too much about the the personal side of, of both these guys, um, and from what I gather, it's um, getting good feedback. It's getting outstanding feedback, yeah. Stephen. I haven't yet had a chance to go and see it yet, purely because I was going to watch the likes of Glass. <laughs> but yeah. I will get mm -hmm. round to watching this film. I love Steve Coogan, really big fan of John C. Reilly too. Those two together are going to be interesting to say the least. Certainly the vibes I got from the trailer looked very promising indeed. They looked like they were embodying the pioneering and in town and figures of uh, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. This uh, is a thing you've got to remember as well, John. Um, you know, you can take Coogan and, and uh, Riley and, and, and put them into these roles, yeah. but they're stepping into very big shoes. Yeah, you know? yeah. And in um, Oliver Hardy's not a case, lot of, literally, yeah, big shoes. Not a lot of actors can pull this off, but they certainly seem to have really embodied their uh, personalities and, the, did, char and yeah. the characters on screen because we do see there's a lot of shots where they're performing as well what we're used to seeing from yeah. Lauren Hardy but seeing the, the personal side to them as well is a tall order for any actor Yeah, I think I've seen a short little scene of them replicating that famous dance even the, yeah. which is a very hard thing to do because yeah. obviously it was choreographed but it had to come off in a way that felt natural as if it was coming straight from, from nothing essentially yeah. they were getting right into it so the fact of nailed those little intricacies is fantastic I've seen Steve Coogan speaking about uh, just portraying Stan Laurel on a number of different chat shows now and he seems like a guy who very much honoured to step into this role, a guy who was um, a big fan and obviously Stan Laurel had a big impact on him as a child uh, growing yep. up, a towering figure in the world of comedy and just in general he's just a fantastic man to two of them were. So he looks as though he's just grabbed this chance, he's, he was talking about just not just nailing the mannerisms and just the speech but just everything about the character, getting that essence and it looks as though they've done it. I've heard from a whole host of uh, sources that it's very, very good, Stephen. Not just people who are like, film critics on the likes of Rotten Tomatoes, but ran just random sources that they've got great fun yeah. out of this film and it's actually, as you said, made them quite emotional watching it. Uh, you look at some of the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, it's getting a 90, um, 92% rating from the critics, 88% from the audience. Yeah. And I'll say that much of a not much of a gap there between no, not both frames. Which is yeah. a rare thing these days yeah. uh, when you're getting a consensus on a film being very good. That is very promising indeed and I'm glad to see it because I love the two people as I did see involved in the primary of the rules. And just to cut the, the story itself, it's something that I'm really intrigued to see. Learn about these uh, great men behind the scenes, what they were getting up to, what powered them uh, to just be the way they were in terms of personal and professional life. But you look at it as saying I'm nuts about Warren and Hardy uh, and the people, the folks behind Biofolk, uh, Bioflick, Stan and Ollie. Clearly adore them more. Uh, and they're saying the likes of it just magnanimously, magnanimously, if I can say it, invites us into a world no less recognisable for being almost entirely erased. And that, that, what they're saying there is just seeing behind the scenes what made these people tick. And it just, uh, you look through it, it just seems to be the consensus is that it's a fantastic film, it delivers, and that the performances are fantastic. So uh, Coogan and Riley inject an impeccable, uh, inject an impeccably depicting a uh, partnership that wasn't fully appreciated. Until yeah. Hardy's rapidly fading health and last laugh. So that's a general thing you see, Stephen, throughout the whole wide variety of artist, uh, uh, arts, artistry, I should say, 
Yeah, you see it in the actual artists as well. They don't yeah. become appreciated until they're gone. The likes of Picasso and just Van Gogh and stuff like that. And you see it with the, this as well. Artists and uh, the music industry and the film industry. They yeah. don't become appreciated until they're gone and you realise what you've lost. So it's going to be great to see this film when yeah. I finally get to see it. Can't discuss uh, the worldwide box office because... As of yet, I don't think it's released anywhere other yeah. than in the United Kingdom. Unusual so. for us to get yeah. that first. But uh, yeah. we'll move on to number two this week, and it's third yeah. week, John. It's the favourite, grossing mm -hmm. uh, another two point four million over the weekend. Overall, eight point three million. Yeah, I went to see this one yeah. a couple of weeks back last week. In actual fact, I should say, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, Stephen. It was a strange, strange sort of a biopic. I don't think it's a biopic. I think some of the figures in the film are real people, but it's very much. Um, a, fantastical take on history. It's set in the 18th century England. Um, there's a war going on between France and England and we see these figures of um, Queen Anne, yeah. uh, Lady Sarah and uh, Abigail who's played by yeah, Emma Stone. She's a servant, yeah. Yeah, they're the three primary figures, it's three female figures and they're really vying for the attention of Queen Anne. Queen Anne's a strange sort of a, you almost feel sorry for her in many ways but then in other ways she's quite a, she's quite a, annoying. <laughs> quite demanding. She likes yeah. to get her legs rubbed and stuff. She's ailing in this form. She's got a lot of health issues. As and a queen up. does, yeah. Yeah, as a queen does. She's got a fondness for, um, I believe it's, I can't remember. It's like small little animals, hamsters or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a strange film. It's full to the brim with, with dark uh, comedy and an interesting thematic is going on underneath as well. Whole host of great performances in there, none less so than Olivia Coleman, who's obviously won uh, yeah. a Golden Globe for her performance. Probably will get nominated for Best Actress at the Oscars. That's coming up very shortly, Stephen. Yeah. Rachel Weisz, outstanding as ever. An actress I've enjoyed for a number of years. As Lady Sarah, a very calculating and uh, almost cold figure. She will kill people, <laughs> not give a damn. Yeah. She shoots birds and whatnot. She's uh, very much an 18th century figure. Cold and calculating, an 18th century aristocratic figure, I should say. Emma Stone as well as Abigail. What can you say about her? An Oscar, her Academy Award winning actress. She is sublime as well, Stephen. She was a kind of a, a sly figure as well. At the start, you feel sorry for her. She's down in her luck. She's fallen in hard times, had to go out and uh, really resort to prostitution and going with a German figure, I think she says at one point. And she slowly tries to regain her uh, aristocracy and she yeah. does it to very startling effect. I did see Nicholas Hope was in there again. I don't see his name, but he's a leader of the opposition and he's a very interesting figure as well. Kind of a flips the... The modern day takes time between male and female figures. Uh, the males are all dressed up in wigs and tarting themselves up in, uh, yeah. <laughs> in makeup, and the female figures are in power and don't really give a damn. It's an interesting film, it's beautifully written, stunning visually, very interesting score. You look at the Rotten Tomatoes, Stephen, 93% critics, 62% from the audience. I can't get the worldwide box office figures just now because I don't have it on me. But I'll let you maybe chip in. Well, for it, Steve. Not yeah. doing that great. 42.5 million dollars. I, I think you covered it well, John. But as yeah. yeah, I love a Coleman in evening. there. Um, <laughs> I, I've not seen the film, yeah. but I do want to see the film because purely because she's in it. I'm a big fan of Olivia Coleman, as you but know. But she's sublime in it, Steve. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, the supporting cast as well is fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one of those films. Um, there's so much on just now, and there so is, much yeah. that's come out over the last week or so. Is it? A priority? Um, probably not. I think if po probably Stan and Ollie didn't come out, yeah. uh, Mary Queen of Scots has come out shortly as well. Yeah, uh, if it's not so. already, it's out. Yeah. 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 Um, so there's Glass. a host, uh, Glass as well, which um, I, you know, I couldn't go and see. Um, I know you did, mm -hmm. but listen, this is one I do want to go and see um, purely because I, I do like Olivia Coleman. I know I'm going to get a good performance in there, and rightly so that she won the Golden Globe a few yeah. weeks ago. Um, but we'll move on, John, to yes. uh, number three this week. It's Mary Poppins returns in its fourth week. Crossing a 2.3 million over the weekend, uh, very much impressive. 38.2 million overall, which is very impressive for UK figures. It is, it's very, very impressive, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, certainly after what three weeks, as you said, uh, and worldwide, 306 million dollars worldwide off of a 130 million dollar budget. This may have really been, uh, they have been proven right. Yeah. I'm moving this film to December, I'm keeping it in December, and moving so to May. It's done. Extremely well at the box office, and I'm not surprised, Stephen. Emily Blunt is superb as Mary Poppins, not quite reaching the, the heights of Julie Andrews, sadly. Yeah. I don't think Solo would have affected this film. No, I don't think was. it would have. No, yeah. it's two very distinct yeah. audiences. I don't think the people who go and watch a Star Wars film are the same people who would go and watch a Mary Poppins film, although I go and watch Star Wars films, and I watched a Mary Poppins film, but I watched it purely out of intrigue, Stephen, because I'd only yeah. watched the original a couple of months back, and I was intrigued to see how it compared. 
It doesn't compare quite as well as the original. The original was an absolute classic though. There's very few films in that genre would compare to the original Mary Poppins film. It's not got as memorable a soundtrack. It's still got a very good soundtrack though. Visually outstanding, superb. Uh, and just a whole host of interesting characters and uh, acting in there from the likes of Ben Wishman and Emily Bunt. So I'm very happy to see it's done well at the box office here and yeah. abroad. Number four this week is Aquaman John in its fifth week. Mm -hmm. It's grossed down a 1.2 million over the weekend and a very impressive 20.2 million overall. Yeah. Um, talked about this film over the last few weeks, haven't we? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, during some film reviews with, uh, from Philip yeah. and uh, the movie couple as well covered couple, this. Yeah, Jerry and Elizabeth. Yeah, and we've covered this um, very much so in the box office over the last uh, few weeks as well, over mm -hmm. the Christmas period. It's a film um, I'll certainly be getting on Blu-ray. Um, yeah. I've, I've got all the DC ones actually up to now. Yeah. So um, this is a welcome addition. This is the one, as we know, it's the most successfully financially for DC and Warner Brothers as well up mm -hmm. to now. Mm -hmm. um, do I like it better than Wonder Woman? Uh, Wonder Woman, um, I think it's probably on par with yeah. that. Um, my favourite is still The Man of Steel um, for different reasons, just because I'm a massive uh, Superman Aren't fan. But um, this was um, an underdog for me because if you told me when The Man of Steel came out that five years down the line, or six years down the line, Aquaman it was going to be uh, the was biggest, gonna, was be the the biggest top grossing I DCEU film. I would film. have told you you were an mental. Absolute, yeah. you know? And I would have agreed with you, Stephen, yeah. but when you get the likes of Jason Momoa, he's an immensely likeable guy, a very popular guy. Although, Stories I heard about him ripping pages out of books is not really doing much for his reputation. I don't care about that though. He's probably done it in a fun and... Maybe he's just a big digital man, yeah, you know? Yeah, audio, big, uh, yeah. audio books and yeah. Throw that know, book, books and get stuff. Get that to hell. Yeah. I want Kindle now. But yeah. look, when you bring a guy of his uh, standing in, uh, you're going to do very well with a certain part of the demographic. I don't want to shoot on it into female only, Stephen, because there may be males out there that enjoy Jason Memoir as well as a figure. I certainly enjoy him as a man. I think he's a fantastic guy off the screen. Likes yeah. his drink, very <laughs> likeable chap, always comes across well, and he comes across well as Arthur Curry as well. He's outstanding as Aquaman, uh, by far the best performance in the film. It's all about him, he yeah. pills it with absolute ease. Don't want to do Amber Heard of the surface as well, though, in the likes of William Defoe and Patrick Wilson, who we were speaking about earlier, Stephen, obviously with Kevin as well. Yeah, uh, fantastic actor, enjoyed him for a number of years. He's got great range, he play a whole host of interesting characters. So, not surprised to see he come in and done superb as Orm, obviously the jilted half-brother of Pat, uh, Arthur, I was about to say Patrick. Yeah. But look, 1.6, and not 1.6, 1 billion and 63 million uh, worldwide at the box office. I'm going into that in a completely wrong manner, Stephen. I'm trying to make that hard for myself, and it should be fairly easy. Just over 1 billion dollars yeah, at uh, the box office. Sounds much better. Yeah. It's done extremely well. Hats off to James Wan and uh, also the new regime at DC. I'm pulling this off, I'm one of brothers are pulling this off. I finally steadied the ship, Stephen, and I want to see them getting their finger out and continuing this degree of excellence into the likes of Wonder Woman 1984, Four, yeah. 84, yeah. and also the Birds of Prey film, and hopefully an Ezra Miller Flash film at some point, and the Batman, the Batman and yeah. hopefully a Superman film as well. Hopefully they've got their finger out. And the Joker! It's all happening, so, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. all happening for DC, and this is a good start. Yeah. So I'm glad. This is us halfway through the, the blog rundown here. Yeah. Um, we're on to, not the blog rundown, the box the office chat, sorry. Um, a few days again. ahead here, but again, the next <laughs> film that we're actually going to talk about is going to be discussed on the blog rundown. Is, so yeah, we'll Bumble keep Bumble this very light, John. It's That's Bumblebee. Right. It's in its third week mm -hmm. here in the UK. It's uh, grossed uh, 1 million over the weekend. Yes. Overall, 10.7 million. As I said, we'll keep this very light because mm -hmm. we are going to get into it much more on Thursday um, yeah. on the blog rundown. Uh, it's a film, John. Um, I, I liked the trailers for it. Yeah. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, very stupidly didn't connect it to the Transformers franchise well, at first, but I know that was the intention of yeah. the director, um, Travis Knight. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a film, I think, um, I, I think I'm going to wait for this to come out on digital. Um, I don't think I'm going to go along to the cinemas to see Yeah, if you're not a fan of yeah. the Transformers franchise, Stephen, uh, or you've not been someone that's followed the Transformers franchise, then you're, you're not going to connect the dots. Uh, they've been very deliberate in the way they've marketed yeah. the film. It's a prequel, and they're trying to disconnect it from the other franchise, uh, because of the other Transformers films in that franchise, because they were very much ever diminishing returns, uh, and people were growing tired of the incredible trailers and it not translating into the actual yeah. film itself. This, thankfully, had a fantastic trailer. I enjoyed it. Yeah. We both enjoyed it. 
and it did translate well into the film I enjoyed the I, film I might be wrong in this John I think yeah. they've done the right thing here by personalising one character yeah uh, well yeah. the main character being Bumblebee and um, humanising to a point well the other Transformer films were um, there was too much happening in them for me too many uh, yeah. characters as far as the you know, Decepticons yeah. and you know, Transformers, and as you said, very CG heavy. And it's Michael Bay. This is more personalised. It's more of a um, street-level version of those films. Yeah. Um, more humanised, uh, more emotion and in there as well. it's a PG film, Stephen, so and they're connecting it to a wider range of demographics. If they give you a big, lovable yeah. primary and, and figure. visually, it's, it's succeeded visually as well. Visually outstanding, yeah. and as uh, we will get into in the blog rundown, I think it was Phil that done it. Yes. Nailed it, the score. Very, very good. I never touched upon that in previous weeks. A very 80s-centric score and fantastically integrated into the film. $400 million worldwide now, Stephen, off of a $135 million budget. It's a very successful release, and I'm glad because I enjoyed it, and I really like Travis Knight as a director. Yeah. Haley Steinfeld outstanding as well, but look, we'll get into that film in much more depth, yeah. hopefully, in Thursday. Number six this week it yeah. is Bohemian Rhapsody, John, Still the Queen there. biopic. It's um, at 12 weeks now, a long 12 time. 12 weeks, yeah. Three it months. Um, <laughs> One million over the weekend, overall £50 million. Pounds. Very impressive for the Out. UK figures, isn't it? Absolutely outstanding yeah. figure, Stephen. That has now got to be really... I think over the last 12 weeks we've mm -hmm. been talking about the film and its performances mm -hmm. but this country, uh, UK that is, um, have such a um, connection, a yeah. Yeah, they have such a, a love for the band Queen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I say this every week I think, I'm not a massive fan of Queen, I never was, yeah. I grew up with R.E.M. etc. Um, the Beatles. But yeah. they were always a band up to 1991 when Freddie Mercury sadly passed away. It was always um, basically the soundtrack of the, of the 1980s for me mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Um, hit after hit, Radio Gaga, you know. Um, Bicycle. I, I want it all. Oh, great. Of Frank. Yeah, fantastic, you know, especially in the, the sort of late 70s, early yeah. 80s. But throughout the 80s as well, they were always a soundtrack uh, to my grown up. Mm -hmm. um, and that was through Freddie Mercury, his yeah. voice. Um, it will never be forgotten. The man will never be forgotten. He's an absolute no. legend. This film, for me, um, what I got out of it was it was a side of the band I didn't know about. Um, I know it didn't delve right into yeah. everything, and I think a lot of people that was their bugbear. But it didn't. I didn't bother me because I think we got a good balance of the performing side of the band. And the sort yeah. of backstage story of the band. So yeah, I thought the it backstage worked. story yeah. of Freddie Mercury as well. Yeah. It did hint at the loneliness yeah. of a man, despite yeah. him having everything, despite him being one of the towering uh, artistical figures of the nineteen eighties. He still had his, his insecurities and stuff like that, and yeah. just personal strife and turmoil. And it did go into that. And I thought uh, Rami Malek portrayed that outstandingly well. I thought he really got into the character, into the soul and the essence of the man. And it was an outstanding performance and I think and I hope he will get nominated for an Oscar for Best Actor. I um, think he will. I agree with you Stephen, yeah. I wasn't a big fan of uh, Queen in terms of just their album numbers, obviously their hits, it's much like Guns N' Roses. Yeah. I will listen to their hits and enjoy them and get great uh, enjoyment out of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to go back and listen to their lesser known album numbers like I would with the Beatles who could release any song really mm -hmm. from an album and it could be a hit. Yeah. Because just quality control throughout all of their albums just yeah. Consistently sublime. But look, I'm getting sidetracked. $798 million worldwide, Stephen. A $52 million budget. Uh, so it's a complete and utter success for uh, Dexter Fletcher. I'm not going to say Brian Singer, because he quit halfway through the film yeah. and uh, caused a whole lot of unnecessary grief for this film, just being connected with it in general. Yeah. Um, but Which look, is a shame. It's a shame, shame for the actors, you know. It's a shame for the actors. But look, here alone, Stephen, it's made its budget back $52 million. That's probably about $45, $40 million. It's already kind of a paid back it's primary budget it's production cost so it's a success and I'm happy for it because it's a great film I'm and happy for Dexter it. Fletcher as well um, but he's going to have some consolation not consolation I don't think it's the right word but yeah. I think um, this biopic for Elton John um, yeah Rocketman um, yeah. I think he's, that's going to be a success as well I Elton John yeah. lived a very um, is still living a very uh, interesting life yeah it's got fantasy Certainly, aspects to it yeah, you don't that, even need to add that for I Elton think, John no but I think it'll work yeah. but um, we'll move on Absolutely. John this is uh, number seven this week. Mm -hmm. um, it's a film called Colette, which yeah. is in its first week. It's grossed 800,000 over the weekend and obviously overall um, 800,000. This mm -hmm. is a film that stars Keira Knightley, 
Fiona Shaw, Dominic West, I like him. Mm -hmm. uh, and this film is about uh, Colette, who is pushed by her husband to write novels under his name. Upon their success, she fights to make her talents known, challenging gender norms. Yeah. Um, it's, I don't know if this is based on a true story. I'm well, sure. I mean, this was something, Stephen, I think that was very prevalent back in the sort of like the 18th and the 19th century. Right, okay. Where you would, uh, I don't think female, fi female figures were also not empowered enough to, to write. Yeah. They probably wouldn't get a publishing deal back then just because of the uh, sexism the that was quality, rampant back yeah, then. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. But I've seen it even as recently as uh, the, finest, the Finest Hour, the Finest Hour, uh, the, uh, sort of a, what do you call it, a film about, obviously, uh, propaganda. Yeah, that's the what odd, propaganda yeah. film. Yeah. And just the fight that the female figures had to obviously get involved in filmmaking and doing scripts and stuff like that. They faced trouble even as... Late or early, uh, or late back is um, or recently, I should say, Stephen, if I can get my tongue out, as recently as the 1940s. So, this was a problem even till recent times that it was prevalent. But certainly, novel uh, writers and stuff like that back in the day had to assume sort of aliases or take on their husband's names to get publishing deals. And it seems like this is going to be the case with uh, obviously the Kieran Knightley figure of Colette. She's going to have to take on her husband's name to get her work out there and get it. Yeah, I think, um, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, yeah. John, but I think that was I one did. of the reasons that um, J.K. Rowlands yeah. um, went under, you know, the, the initials J.K. Um, I think um, she was very conscious of, yeah. of this as well, which is quite sad in this day yeah. and age. Uh, I can understand. Back you know, then, yeah, it back was then, rampant but, back then. Um, certainly not nowadays, I would certainly hope, but no. uh, that's probably my naivety creeping in there. Um, She's went on to be a very successful one of the multi-millionaire, yeah, and, yeah. and rightly so as well. I think she's created her own her own worlds uh, with that franchise, and, yeah. and certainly still doing it with the Fantastic Beasts. Um, but John, uh, Wash Westmoreland, don't know anything about the chap. I know that he's done a lot of short films, a um, couple of music videos as well. Mm. Unusual name, Wash, isn't it? Or, or Wash? I'm not really sure how you. <laughs> Now, like we certainly use the name Wash, wash. But that's, <laughs> that's for something totally different. I think um, it would be Wash, Stephen. Yeah. But yeah, it's a biography drama history film, so I'd presume that this Colette figure is indeed yeah. a real I figure in so, history, yeah. and that she's. Yeah. So it seems like an interesting film, Stephen. It seems like an interesting concept. It's going to be very drama heavy, and yeah. I, I can't think of a better actress to come in and Keira Knightley and portraying this figure. Yeah. You know, she's very vivacious and ferocious figure at times when she wants to be so. Yeah. I'm going to be intrigued by it. I may give it a watch. I'm not going to go to the cinema and watch it. There's too much to see just now for me, yeah. sadly. But I will give it a bash if it pops up on Netflix at some point, and even Sky Movies. Uh, but it's an intriguing uh, period piece drama, and I do like those, Stephen, as you do know. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's something I might give a watch. $5 million worldwide, just out, so it's doing pretty good doing okay, for yeah. a small budget film. Number eight this week is The Upside, John. It's yes. uh, in its first week. It's grossed 700,000. Now, this is a film that caught her eye mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. This is starring Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston. Nicole Kidman's in there as well. Yeah. Um, getting kind of average ratings at the moment. I think um, you know why, Stephen. I think we all know why. <laughs> and this directed by Neil Berger, who I don't know who he is. but uh, It's a film. Uh, it's got Brian Cranston in it. I watch anything Brian Cranston's in, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think he's an absolutely yep. sublime actor. One of my yep. favourite mm -hmm. actors since I finally got around to watching uh, Breaking Bad. Obviously, he played Walt White, yeah. a.k.a. Heisenberg, and that. He's just a fantastically varied man uh, in terms of his acting choices. He's went from the likes of Godzilla mm -hmm. into doing the likes of this. He's playing a quadriplegic Stephen, and I think a lot of the critical uh, feedback is because he is having the audacity to play a quadriplegic and sit in a wheelchair. They don't like that says it before, precious petals in today's society don't like subjects like this being handled. Uh, what was it that Kate Winslet said back in Extra? Uh, extras? Um, if you play, if you want to get an Oscar, play a cripple. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can't do that now because you'll get absolutely crucified yeah. by the critics. And you probably Kevin, can't say that now either. You can't say that either. Yeah. Crucified, that's uh, religious uh, bigotry or whatever. I don't care. I'll say it. Kevin Hart as well, Stephen. Also with this Ferrari and the controversy over him saying the uh, these tweets from 10 years ago and apologising, did he apologise, didn't he apologise, he says he did. I tend to take Gavin Hart's word for that because he's a very honest man. A guy I like, in the main, a very funny guy at times, I liked his work with uh, the likes of Dwayne Johnson. And he looks really good here too, he's playing a convict who uh, tries to get pro I believe and he 
that's something we've talked about and ends up being this guy's primary carer, this guy being Philip Lacassi or Lacassi, played by Brian Cranston. As you did say, Steve, not getting a great critical response, no. but certainly we're seeing that disconnect that we spoke about time and again between this and the, criti- uh, and the, audience. the audience. The audience yeah. have given it, given it an 88% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The critics Thank just you know. 40%. So I think if I was to go and see this film, and I do plan on going and see this film, I think I will side with the audience because I think it looks very intriguing. It looks full of fun and comedy and it's got some heartwarming moments in there. And those two together just look like a match made yeah. in heaven. To Unfortunately, me. John, some critics um, take the sort of real life elements yeah. into you know their enjoyment of a film and judge it on that and you certainly shouldn't do that um, they're going to go very deep yeah. into the film's court Stephen and judge just like th- the style of uh, shooting and the yeah. themes that's exploring and stuff they'll go right dark into, deep into the film whereas the audience will just go in and enjoy it for what it is they'll enjoy the superficial side less so than the, the more thematic side so yeah. nothing wrong with that but yeah. look what a white box office sitting at $48 million dollars off of a $37.5 million production budget. It's not been out very long at all, Stephen. No. I think it will make a sliver of a profit. Yeah. And I hope it does. Yeah. Number nine this week is Ralph Breaks the Internet and it's seventh week. Yeah. It's grossed another £600,000 over the weekend. Overall, £16.7 million. I'd like to say it's mm. an impressive um, for a film that um, is a sequel to a very successful film. Um, yeah. I think that's very disappointing, John, but I think that's... Um, UK audiences with animation at times quite it's fickle quite, bunch quite, yeah. yeah it's quite uh, dicey well, at Stephen, times I will try and find it's but, UK um, I'll give her on until you do John yeah. it, it's certainly a film I enjoyed I, I didn't like it as much I shouldn't really say I didn't like it um, yeah. I didn't get the same sort of enjoyment out of it as I did for um, Wreck-It Ralph which um, I think it was due to the animation at the time I was very um enamoured with it. I, th- I felt it was a um, something that was um, different. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly a lot of animations now are using the same sort of style and stuff like that. Um, but the film yeah. itself, John, I, I liked it. I thought it was a good follow-up. I just felt it came out a little bit longer than it should have. Um, it certainly wasn't on the same kind of level as The Incredibles and the mm-hmm. wait we had to wait for the, that sequel, which the Incredibles to me is um, was a you know an original timeless film, um, and a lot of people would, probably wouldn't have minded if there wasn't another yeah. film made because the the original film was so good. With uh, Wreck It Ralph, it was a great film, um, not brilliant, but yeah. did we really need a sequel? Probably not. Um, well, but I liked it. I, I it. thought I got, I got a great deal of enjoyment out of yeah. it. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, just the two primary figures of the yeah. Nepi and Ralph. So played by Sarah Silverman and John C. Reilly, respectively. I thoroughly enjoyed it, Stephen. It is topping Wreck-It, uh, Wreck-It Ralph in terms of domestic success in the United States, but worldwide, it's sitting just shy by about $20 million. Yeah. $455 million worldwide. An absolute success of a film. Very successful here too as well, Stephen. $16 million is not a pound is nothing uh, to cry about in the United Kingdom. Definitely it's not, a no. very decent sum for a... Very decent animated yeah. film. It's not an outstanding yeah, the, animated the film. The final film we'll talk about, John, is very briefly, because time is pressing, it's Spider-Man yes. Into the Spider-Verse, <laughs> and it's fifth week, it's crossed 600,000, well. uh, overall 8.6 <coughs> million. Loved the film, mm-hmm. did a review on this, came out on Christmas Day, it shows you how far back ago I watched this film. Yeah. Loved it. Miles Morales, to me, is the future Peter Parker. Oh, very controversial, Stephen. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yep. Certainly for Sony, I think he is. Yep. But for the MCU, I think Peter Parker is very much safe. $322 million worldwide, Stephen. $90 million budget. Well and truly made a profit. Thoroughly enjoyed the film. I've said it time and again. We've spoken about it on the likes of the blog rundown and for the last five weeks. And the box office chat, $8.6 million. Uh, pounds. Very disappointing for a film of this excellence in the United Kingdom. I don't know what the hell is going on there. It may be a disconnect in geek culture between the United Kingdom and the United States. I don't know, Stephen. I enjoyed it for a great many reasons, but we're running out of time here, so I'm going to have to wrap this show up. We have got a 30-minute recording limit. We'd just like to thank you for watching us, gibbering away here about the UK's box office for this weekend. If you're enjoying the content we're putting out, like below, comment, subscribe, and we'll be back tomorrow with Movie Burner News.